Good morning. Um, today I've got this talk article which is uh, titled as Urinary Tract Injuries in Laparoscopic Gynecological Surgery, Prevention, Recognition and Management. Um, so I've summarised this article for you as it's quite an important one, uh, not just for the exams, but also for your clinical practice. I hope you'll find this video useful. And if you do, then please don't forget to uh, click the thumbs up button and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Urinary bladder injury. So injury rates are between 0.02% to 8.3%, placing bladder injury top of the list of visceral damage complications related to laparoscopic pelvic surgery. During dissection of the bladder from the cervix, that's during uh, a hysterectomy when you are or during a um, or during a cesarean section, when you try and mobilize the bladder, dissect the bladder down, um, this can uh, this most common site of injury is midline above the interureteric bar. Less often, bladder can be put at risk during insertion of a various needle or a trocar. RCOG, suprapubic insertion of various needle, is not recommended and should be avoided as the dome of the bladder is at risk of injury and there's high failure rate. So during a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, when the bladder is dissected adequately off the cervix, on you know, off the upper part of the vagina to avoid injury during during suturing. So if there is an injury, it can be recognized during laparoscopy because of obvious cystotomy or visual, visualization of urine leakage. Um, if there's a suspicion um, that might be uh, alarmed, if there is a hematuria in, in, in the catheter bag or there's distended catheter bag because of gas leaking through the defect. Intraoperative cystoscopy and or uh, installation of 200 to 300 mils of coloured saline, such as with methylene blue or indigo, um, into the bladder will help identify the site and the extent of injury. So bladder injury commonly presents like with suprapubic pain, hematuria, leakage of urine per vagina and oligouria. Sterile urine does irritate the peritoneum, causing a form of chemical peritonitis, called, not called as uroperitoneum. Peritoneum. Uroperitoneum, with, with uroperitoneum, you have diffuse abdominal pain, distension and ileus. Tenderness may be absent in the first uh, 48 hours post-operative unless a thermal injury has occurred. Thermal injuries present after 10 to 14 days with uroperitoneum or vesicogenital fistula. CT with contrast confirm presence of uroperitoneum and or show direct evidence of injury. Retrograde cystography will confirm diagnosis and cystoscopy will assess the injury and help plan management. Most bladder injuries can be sutured with one or two in, in one or two layers using a 2O or 3O absorbable suture. Non-locked repair method should be used um, and the sutures should be placed 0.5 to 1 centimeter apart and 0.5 to 1 centimeter lateral to the cystotomy angles um, is, is what's suggested. Bladder catheter inserted and continuous uh, post of bladder drainage should be allowed for at least two weeks which then allows the healing of this cystotomy, uh, the hole in the bladder. Antibiotics should also be administered for at least five to seven days and indwelling catheter, as we said, should be kept in for at least two weeks. Now, risk factors for urinary tract injury due to distorted pelvic anatomy, so things like endometriosis, cancer, adhesions, severe genital organ prolapse, Obesity, pregnant uterus can all can all distort the pelvic anatomy and hence um, make it more likely for a urinary tract injury to happen. C 
Safety measures to prevent laparoscopic electrosurgical complications. So inspect insulation carefully before use. Use lowest possible effective power setting. Use available technology, newer tissue response uh, generators and active electrode monitoring technology. Eliminate concerns about insulation failure and capacitative coupling. Use a low voltage waveform wave for monopolar diathermy. Cut. Use bipolar electrosurgery where, when appropriate. Use brief intermittent activation. Do not activate in close proximity or direct contact with another instrument. Ensure that both the heel and the tip of the bipolar forceps are kept under direct view when activating. Ureteric injury. So the rates are between 0.06% to, um, you know, in 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 cases like laparoscopic subtotal hysterectomies to 21% in deep infiltrating endometriosis associated with hydronephrosis. Most common sites of ureteric injury in laparoscopic surgery is pelvic brain, where the ureter comes into close proximity with the infundibular pelvic ligament, which contains ovarian vessels, and lateral to the cervix um, during di di division or coagulation of the uterine artery, or the uterosacral and the cardinal uterine ligaments. So the three common sites are the pelvic brim, the um, lateral to the cervix, and the uterosacral and the cardinal uterine ligaments. So post-op um, ureteric um, injury can present as flank pain and tenderness, hematuria, oligouria, or watery vaginal loss within the first 48 hours of acute injury. Thermal injury is delayed necrosis and or fistula formation is between 10 and 14 days post-op. Ultrasound and or CT scans can help evaluate things like hydronephrosis may be seen, urinomas, abscesses, CT, IV, urogram will locate the injury. Up to 25% of unrecognized ureteral injuries result in eventual loss of the ipsilateral kidney. That's quite serious. Types of ureteric injury, you've got your angulation, crush, ligation, thermal, laceration, transection, resection. And the most commonest type of um, ureteric injury is the transection type. So upper, if there is an injury in the upper third of the ureter, an end-to-end -end reanastomosis um, is, is done to repair it, so it's called ureteroureteriostomy. If, there's a, if, the, if the ureter, the injury is in the middle third, um, then a ureteroureteriostomy can be done or a transureteroureteriostomy can be done. Um, so an end-to-end, end-to-side -end, uh, end anastomosis of the injured ureter with a contralateral healthy ureter. Transurethro-urethrostomy uh, involves in, intentional injury and risk to contralateral healthy ureter and should not be used as a first-line option. If there's an injury in the lower third of the ureter, then a urethroneocystotomy uh, needs to be done, which means reimplantation of the ureter into the bladder. If a tension-free anastomosis cannot be achieved by simple reimplantation, then uh, a psoas hitch or a boary flap can be performed. So surgical principles of ureteric repair, adequate but careful debridement to avoid shortening the ureter, adequate but careful dissection to avoid devascularization, anastomosis must be watertight, tension-free, spatulated or, fi or fish mouth. Use absorbable and intermittent sutures, avoid using too many sutures, Use drainage, um, consider a mental flap to cover the repair site and increase vascularity. When possible, repair by laparoscopy. So this picture, they're showing um, the, an example of trans ureterostomy, which is done for um, injuries in, in the in the middle middle third of the of the ureter. So uh, as, as they were saying on the previous slide, that this involves intentionally uh, damaging the contralateral healthy ureter. So this should not be done as a first line uh, option um, because then you're also damaging the other ureter that's healthy. 
So this is an example. The top picture is the psoas hitch and the bottom picture is an example of Barry flap. Um, and, and you can see that with with, you know, with with both of these, what you're trying to do is just give the the ureter a bit more of length and, and, and create and kind of like fill that gap between uh, between the ureter and the bladder for the implantation of the ureter into the bladder. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video useful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also share it with your friends and colleagues who you think may benefit from this video and leave a comment below um, of what you found uh, was the most useful part of this video. And I'll continue making lots of revision material for the MRCOG exams because I really understand how difficult uh, that exam is. And if there's anything in particular that you want me to talk about, uh, it could be a topic or a guideline or a TOG article, then please don't hesitate uh, and, and comment down below. Thank you so much for watching.